I'd like to read in the Gospel of Mark, please, chapter 10. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10. And if you want to follow along, we'll begin at verse 17. And we'll go, we'll read from verse 17 down through verse 27. So Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. The text says, and when he, Jesus, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? Why do you call me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. One thing you lack, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered, answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now here's someone that we often call the rich young ruler. He's the subject of our story this evening, the rich young ruler. We refer to him as that because all three words are used of him in the three accounts of this story by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We've read Mark's account, but when you put the three accounts together by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're told that he's rich, we're told that he's young, we're told that he's a ruler. So he has much going for him. He's got youth, and the energy that comes with that, which is quickly leaving many of us, but he had, he had youth, energy, he had money, he had wealth. He had authority. He was a ruler. He had responsibility. And yet, even though he had these things, he still felt that he was lacking. He still felt that he was missing something. And so he comes to the Lord Jesus. He comes to the Lord Jesus with this question. And this, this question tells us that he was more concerned about what happens after this life than, than what was necessarily happening in this life. Because he asked Jesus this question. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I hope there's someone listening this evening, and you're starting to think more about after this life than just what happens during this life. Because there is something after. There's eternity beyond this life. We either go to heaven forever or we miss heaven and we end up in hell forever. There's something after this life and it's eternity. And let me ask you this question. Where are you going when this life is over? It's the most important question you could consider. Where are you going when your life here is over? Well, this man is thinking about eternal life. And so now, by all accounts and by all appearances, we would expect this man to receive the eternal life that he desires because of some of these external actions. 
for one, he came to Jesus. He came to the Lord Jesus. Not many do. Maybe you still haven't. Now he's coming physically to Jesus, but he recognizes that he must come to him with this question about eternal life. So he came to the right person. He came to the right source for eternal life. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Eternal life comes through the Lord Jesus. So he came to the right person. So you might, you might think that he's going to receive eternal life. And not only did he come to the right person, but he came to the right person right away. Right? The, the text tells us that he ran. Verse 17, there came one running. He was running to Jesus. Not too many. You know, there's plenty of people that run away from God. Not too many that run to the Lord. I hope tonight you'll run to him. That there's, you recognize there's an urgency to being made right with God, an urgency, because we don't know when this life will be over. And so he ran to Jesus. You can just picture this cloud of dust on the streets as he hurries his way to Christ. It was a very undignified thing for grown people to be running down the streets in first century Judea. Uh, I think there's still a bit of a uh, hesitancy, isn't there, to be seen running in public unless it's a, an actual race. <laughs> there, there, usually you get to about the age of maybe 12 or 13 and children stop running around from place to place. They begin to walk, right? They just don't want to be seen running. Well, here's a man running to Jesus. So first of all, he comes to Jesus. Secondly, he runs to Jesus. And when he gets there, number three, he kneels at the feet of Jesus. Verse 17 says that there came one running and kneeled to him. He's recognizing his authority. So few bow the knee to Christ that he is worthy that every, Philippians 2 says, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This man knelt. Remember, these are all external things. And then the fourth thing, first he comes to Jesus, second he runs, third he kneels, and fourth he asks a question about eternal life. So by all external appearances, it would seem that we're going to witness a genuine conversion. And we might be reading Mark chapter 10 and think, I know why this, I know why this story is in the Bible. We're going to see a man receive eternal life, but that's not what happens. No, it doesn't happen doesn't end with these words, and he went away saved. No, the text says he went away sorrowful. Doesn't say he went away glad. He went away sad. What happened? What happened to this man? Everything looked so good on the outside. Outwardly, everything looked right. But inwardly, everything was wrong. And it was evident by the time we go through the text together and we listen to what this man says and we, we hear what Jesus says, it's evident that he was wrong about the most important issues of life. And we're going to look at three of them. He was wrong about three things. You can't afford to be wrong about these, the same three things. First of all, he had a wrong view of Christ, about who Jesus was, about what he could give him, about what he could do for this man. He had a wrong view of Christ. Number two, he had a wrong view of sin. He had a wrong view of sin, about how terrible sin is, about how pervasive sin is, about how fatal sin is, and about how guilty he was of committing sin. A wrong view of Christ, a wrong view of sin. Number three, he had a wrong view of salvation. He had a wrong view of eternal life, how to receive it, how badly he needed it, and how he could do nothing to deserve it. Now listen, as you turn the pages of the Bible, you can, you can be wrong about a lot of things. And there's a lot in the Bible that I'm definitely not sure about. It's a big book. 
you can be wrong about a lot of things. You can be wrong about how old the Earth is. You can be wrong about uh, what happened to Noah's Ark. You can be wrong about uh, what country the Antichrist is going to come from. <laughs> These things are not really that important. But you cannot afford to be wrong about Christ, sin, and salvation. And thankfully, the Bible is clear about those three things. And I want to speak on them with you this evening. First of all, I want you to think of the fact that he had a wrong view about Christ. After running and kneeling, he begins the story with, the, the dialogue begins with rather surprising words. It may not, you might wonder why it would be surprising, but the first word out of his mouth is the word good. He says, good master. Good master. You say, what was so unusual about that? Well, the, the Jews never, re, never referred to rabbis as good. They didn't refer to their rabbis or, or their masters as good because that word was allowed to be applied only to God himself, which is why Jesus replies the way that he does in verse 18. He says, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? There is one good, there, there is none good but one, that is God. See, he, he, was, he, he was recognizing that only God is good. And this man called him good teacher, good master. You see, the Psalms say, Psalms 25 and 8 says, good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 86 and 5 says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving. Psalm 106, 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And with that understanding of who God is, you see, you wouldn't say good master unless, unless you really understood who Jesus was. Because you know something? Jesus is God. Jesus is good because he's God. And I wonder, was Jesus testing this man's understanding? You come to me with this statement, good master, do you really believe what you're saying? That would be quite a big admission to, to say Jesus is good and thus God. And, and it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't deny that he himself was good. He doesn't say, why do you call me good? I'm not good. No, he didn't say that. He said, there's none good but one that is God, and then just kind of leaves it at that, right? He's testing this man's understanding. Well, look at verse 20. We're going to skip a little bit and go back. But in verse 20, the next time he speaks to Jesus, it says, and he answered and said unto him, master, not good master this time, just master. There went the word good. So much for thinking that Jesus was God after all. And so here he and many others who lived in this time and many people that live just now, maybe you, he and many others have fallen terribly short in their view of who Christ is. Listen, you can be wrong about a lot of people on this earth. You can be wrong about a lot of people. You can't afford to be wrong about Jesus Christ. He is God. He is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He is, the Bible says, he is God manifest in flesh. The Apostle John wrote, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, was, and when Jesus was born, he was called Emmanuel. What, what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. God was with us here on this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And so this man missed out on what Jesus could do for him, and what he could give him, because he had a wrong view of him. Now, maybe your problem tonight is the same. You have a wrong view of Christ. You must accept the fact that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, that he is the creator, that he is the one before whom we must bow and acknowledge his ultimate authority. He is the savior. 
He is, listen, he is not someone to help us get to heaven. We don't need a helper. He's not a helper to, you know, we start out the race and we do the best we can in life and we try to live well. And then we're thankful that Jesus came and died and he can get us across the finish line. Listen, we can't even take off from the starting line. We're ruined in sin. We need a savior. And Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He is God manifest in flesh. That means that everything he says is authoritative. That means all of his claims are true. And we have to bow and acknowledge his authority. And Jesus said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. You acknowledge that tonight. Are you willing to accept Jesus for who he is? He is God, manifest in flesh. This man missed it. So many did. He was that close to the Savior and missed an understanding of who Jesus Christ really was. You can be wrong about a lot of things, but if you're wrong about Christ, you're dead wrong and you're going to miss heaven. But this man had not only a wrong view of Christ, he had a wrong view of sin. And that is evident when we get further into the story. Verse uh, 19, Jesus says then, you know the commandments. He's asked about eternal life. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he stops there and he waits. What was Jesus doing? Was Jesus telling him that the way to receive eternal life was by keeping the commandments? On the surface, that's what it looks like he's doing. Was Jesus teaching the way to receive eternal life was by keeping the law? Absolutely not. In fact, the Bible says elsewhere, right? Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 says, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Let me repeat that. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified or declared right with God in his sight. It's not possible. If it were possible, then why did Jesus even come? If you could be right with God by just keeping the law, then why did God send his son? the Lord Jesus, into the world at all. Just keep the law. That's the message. Keep the law. Do the best you can. And there are plenty of people that think that, right? You just do the best you can, and at the end of life, you'll find out if you did enough. No. The fact that Jesus was here in the first place tells us that's not the answer. No. Why, why did Jesus point him to the commandments? Well, it's because of what the rest of Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 says. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. What does the rest of the verse say? Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so Jesus wanted this man to see his sin, to see that he had failed, to see that he had broken these commandments. See, the law is a mirror if you will. When you look at the law, the Old Testament law and the commandments that Jesus is speaking about here, it's like a mirror to see where we've gone wrong. And Jesus put the mirror to the man's face, but he refused to take an honest look. Because if you take an honest look, you might not like what you see. I remember when the doctor put the mirror to my face after performing surgery right here. He cut me across right here to cut out this cancerous tissue. And then he asked me a question that to this day, I wish I had answered differently. He said, would you like to see what it looks like now that I've cut it open? I said, sure. And then he put the mirror to my face. And I couldn't believe, I, I couldn't believe how drastic the measures were to deal with this problem. When I looked at that, I thought, wow, this really is serious, that it would take that kind of action to fix the problem. 
Now, that's the way it is with us when, when we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word. If we're willing to take an honest look, it's not going to be pleasant. We're not going to like what we see. What we see is that we've, we've sinned against God. David, you shall not steal. I've stolen. David, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. I've lied. David, you shall honor your father and mother. David, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not, you shall, you shall, you shall. And I look at the law and I'm condemned. I'm guilty. I'm sinful if I'm willing to take an honest enough look. But this man, Jesus puts the mirror up and it's almost like he won't even take a look. He hears what Jesus says, but listen to how he responds. Jesus says, you know the commandments, then gives them these commandments. Listen to how he responds. Verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master. Remember now, not good master. He's failed to recognize Christ for who he is. Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Wow. He doesn't say, you know, I'm done, I've done a pretty good job with those commands, Lord. He says, I've kept all of those. And not only have I kept them all, I've kept them all since I was a kid. Give him a nice gold star for how well he's lived. I read that and I say, that's, can you imagine the arrogance to say that I've kept all the commandments since I was a, since I was a youth? If he had really got a good look in the mirror, he would have said what any of us ought to say when we look at God's word and we see what God requires and we see what God calls sin. He ought to have said, and we ought to say, Lord, all these have I broken. And I've broken them many times. Is there anything you can do to save me? Please forgive me. Please save me. I, I, I need a savior. This man wasn't coming to Jesus because he wanted a savior. He wanted a good pat on the back, and he was not going to get it. Maybe your problem tonight is the same. You've got a wrong view of Christ, and you have a wrong view of your sin before God. You think that you're a pretty good person. You look at other people, and you say, well, I don't do the things that they do. I don't behave like that person. I mean, that person's a sinner that does X, Y, or Z, and I haven't done those things, and I've been a pretty good person, and I think that at the end of my life, God will let me into heaven. Then you tell me why Jesus came. Tell me, why did Jesus come? The Bible tells us why he came. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Who were who are the sinners that he came to save? The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He came to save everybody because we're all sinners. This man didn't see that he was a sinner. No, no, no. He was ready to, he was ready to impress the Lord with all the things that he had done. Yes, I've kept all of these from my youth. He wanted eternal life, but he didn't realize that he needed eternal life, that he needed a savior because his sin brought condemnation and that he was headed for judgment. He needed Christ. The only, per the only person that could say all these have I kept from my youth is the man that he said this to, Jesus Christ himself. He's the only one who could ever say, I've kept all of these commandments. He's the giver of the commandments. He is God manifest in flesh, holy, righteous, and just. So he had a wrong view of Christ. He had a wrong view of Sin, that's quite a deadly combination as far as eternity is concerned. Make sure you have a right view of Christ and you have a right view of your sin before God. I hope there's someone tonight and listening to this for the first time, you're going to realize I'm sinful. I'm guilty. I need Christ. I need him as my savior. And he will not turn you away. He will save you because that's what he came into the world to do. He came into the world to go to a cross. And on that cross, he suffered for our sins, the Bible says. The just one in the place of the unjust, that's me. The righteous one in the place of the unrighteous, 
That's me. Christ suffered for sins. The Bible says Christ died for our sins. And the Bible tells us that Christ rose again for our justification. He is the answer. He is the way that you can be saved. And he's the only way. Because he said, I am the way. And because he is God, his word is true. You must bow to his authority. And so this man had, number one, a wrong view of Christ. Number two, he had a wrong view of sin. And finally, number three, he had a wrong view about salvation, about eternal life, and more importantly, how to receive it. Notice his initial question again when we back up to verse 17. Do you notice how he started out? He's running, he's kneeling, and then he says, good master. But his question is this, and it's flawed from the beginning. He says, what shall I do? to inherit eternal life. He was looking to do something. He was looking to do something. What do I need to do more? I've been doing, I've kept this law and I have kept that one and he's checking off the boxes, but he knows that he has a need. He knows that he's not right with God. I hope tonight you realize you're not right with God. And the answer is not another box that you need to check. It's not a matter of what do, what do I need to do more than I've already done in order to receive eternal life. You know what you need? You need someone else to do it for you. And the one that did it for us is Christ. And he didn't just do part of it and he left the rest to you. He did it all. When he was on the cross, after suffering God's wrath for our sins, he said, it's finished. It's done. This man says, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You can't do anything. It's done. The whole message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach is the word grace. That God has provided for us what we need in his son to take us to heaven. This man's gospel, if you, if you can call it a gospel, this man's gospel is summed up in, in one word, and it's works. What shall I do? But the Bible says, no, it's for by grace you are saved through faith. You know what God requires of us? All he requires is our faith. And faith is the opposite of works. Romans 4 says, but to him that works not, but believes, his faith is counted for righteousness. So there's no merit in faith. Faith is giving all the glory to Christ who's done the work to save us. This man's gospel was all summed up in the word works. Jesus says, no, 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 it's not works. And the Bible's message is, we're not made right with God by works. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith, Paul says. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what does he say to Jesus? Master, all these have I observed from my youth, verse 21 says. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. I find that remarkable. After a man is so arrogantly claimed to have kept all of the law from his youth, he doesn't even say, I, uh, I did the best I could, Lord, and I know that I've fallen. He claims to have kept the law from his youth, every bit of it, every one of the commandments. But Jesus still loved him. Jesus loved him. You know what? And even in our arrogance and pride and sin, when we refuse to admit what we are before God, Jesus still loves us. <laughs> he still loves us. He loved us so much that he went to the cross for us. And he loves you right now so much that he wants to be your savior. But he won't save anyone and he can't save anyone that doesn't realize that they need to be saved. <laughs> because you'll never come to him. You'll never put your faith in him if you don't realize that you need him. But he loves you. He loved this man. And then he says to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Was he telling him that if you, if you're almost there, but if you, if you keep this commandment on top of all the others, then you'll enter into heaven? No. Jesus knew that man's heart. 
And so he puts his finger on a very sore spot. Thou shalt not covet. That's another commandment. And it was very evident by his wealth and the fact that he was unwilling to give up any of it, that wealth had a hold of this man. In fact, when Paul summarizes the law in Galatians chapter 5, he says, for the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment. You know how to fulfill the whole law? One commandment. You must love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus says, go do that. Sell what you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. And it was evident here now that he had fallen short, that he didn't have what it takes. Listen, none of us have what it takes. God's law condemns us all. We're all guilty. And there may be certain areas of the law where you think that you're doing better than others, but under every one of those commands, we have fallen short. We have sinned against God. And the law condemns us. We need, we need a savior. We need to be saved from the consequences of our sin. And here he was right in front of the man that could save him. The text says, verse 22, and he went away sad at that saying. He was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And then the disciples, Jesus looks to his disciples. He says, how hard it is for those that have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. How hard it is for those to trust in riches, those that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. See, his wealth had such a hold on him. He had been guilty of breaking God's law. And then Jesus says, verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle to, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And now the disciples are so surprised, they're thinking of the, a, a camel going through the eye of a needle? That's not possible. And that's the point. For those that trust in their wealth, those that trust in themselves in any way, you don't have what it takes to earn, to merit to work enough to obtain eternal life. We don't have what it takes. God does. Jesus says, after they, they, verse 26, and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Jesus looking upon them said, with men it is impossible. We don't, we can't do it. But with God, all things are possible. We need him. He's the savior. We are not. We are guilty. We are sinful, and Christ is the answer, and we must come to him in all of our need. And if we do, we will not go away sad. We will go away saved. We will go away glad. Tonight, you can be dead wrong about all these things as you were at the beginning of this session, about Christ, about sin, about salvation. You can be dead wrong or you can be made right by a change of thinking. That's called repentance. Repentance means to change the mind, to change your mind about who Jesus is. I pray you'll change your mind about your sin. I pray you'll change your mind about the way to obtain eternal life. It is not through works of your own. You will never have what it takes. It's by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that we can be made right with God. Jesus said, he that believes on him has everlasting life. This man wanted eternal life, and Jesus said elsewhere how we obtain it. He that believes on him, simple faith in Christ, gives us. He that believes on him has everlasting life. Our prayer is that you'll trust Christ and receive eternal life, because the Bible says that he, the eternal life is a gift from God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray.